Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Shiloh Community Church online service. Today is a communion Sunday. It is the first Sunday of the month, so I, I do hope that you have your communion items ready. If you're going to be doing this with us at home, if you need to pause before you uh, continue this video so that we can partake of it together at the end of the sermon, your cracker, your juice, what you are using apart from that, uh, it's good to see you. It's good to be seeing friends. We are plodding along at the same uh, steady pace. I do hope you're able to catch the new devotional on Thursday when you get the chance of the Psalms. It's just audio. It's just something to listen to. I hope that is an enjoyment to you and a blessing to you. It comes out uh, whenever it comes out on Thursday. The time is sort of loose. I've left it up there in the air for now. Hopefully moving it to the morning. But apart from that, I would love to see you at our WebEx meeting at 1 p.m. following service and on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. And we will be beginning in this coming week to circulate the prayer requests from these two WebEx meetings to all the people on our membership list. Everyone who is on that list will get the prayer request because we know not everyone can make it to the WebExes for various reasons. But that's it for me, friends. I hope this lengthy introduction won't spoil your enjoyment of this divine service as we are led in musical worship. I will see you at the scriptural reflection. God bless. Them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the blessed but gives to all, wonderful words of life. Sin all is to the loving call, wonderful words of life. All to see redeemed. Growing was to heaven Beautiful words, wonderful words Wonderful words of life Beautiful words, wonderful words Wonderful words of life Sweetly echo the gospel call Wonderful words of life as a pardon and to all wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. Our reflection this morning comes from the book of Second Kings, the 19th chapter and the 22nd to the 28th verse. That's Second Kings chapter 19, verses 22 to 28, reading in the New Revised Standard version. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and haughtily lifted your eyes? Against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers you have mocked the Lord, and you have said with my many chariots, I have gone up the heights of the mountains to the far recesses of Lebanon. I felled its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses. I entered its farthest retreat, its densest forest. I dug wells and drank foreign waters. 
I dried up the sole of my foot, all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you should make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruins, while their inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded. They have become like plants of the field and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops blighted before it is grown. But I know your rising and your sitting, your going out and coming in, and your raging against me. Because you have raged against me, and your arrogance has come to my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will turn you back on the way by which you came. The word of the Lord. Let us consider this passage for a moment from the book of Second Kings. The situation is dire. The city of Jerusalem, the capital of the ancient kingdom of Israel, and the modern-day country of Israel, was under siege by the Assyrian army. The Assyrians mocked the Israelites, saying, God will not deliver you. God does not hear what is going on on this earth. He's not concerned with you. In fact, he's even on my side. He's not really on your side. And so when I destroy you, know that God has abandoned you. And the Lord through Isaiah is declaring that though the king of Assyria trampled through the world at the time, though he conquered countries seemingly with great ease, such that it was like when you step in a puddle of water and like, you know, the water splashes out. That's how the king of Assyria described his conquest The world was just a puddle that he stepped on and the water just moved out of the way of his feet. Though it was like that, the Bible tells us that this was something known to, arranged by God before the world even began. God is sovereign over all events, terrible and non-terrible, good and bad. And that, friends, is a difficult truth. Yet though God is sovereign, even then within his sovereignty... There is special personal intervention. He speaks of the conquest of Assyria from a distance, that they are doing all these things according to his plans, but there will come a time when he will intimately visit them and he will send them back home by the way they came, that they will not conquer God's people because they have blasphemed and mocked Almighty God. Now, in the book of Kings, we know that this happens when an angel of the Lord goes into the camp and strikes down the Assyrian army. But for us today, the significance is as follows. We are faced with many situations where we question God's sovereignty. Sometimes we wish maybe God weren't sovereign because of the nature of the situations we are in. But friends, God is sovereign over everything. His rule and his reign is over all the earth. Even Satan himself submits to the rule of God, even while he is in rebellion to God. And yet, though God is sovereign, and yet though things have been planned from long ago, yet he responds to us. Yet he moves with us. Yet he rewards righteousness and judges iniquity. Yet he hears us when we call. Don't let the sovereignty of God, friends, stop you from praying. And don't let your praying doubt God's sovereignty. Would you join your hearts with me in prayer? Almighty God, we come before you. You who made the heavens and the earth, the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-amazing one, the unknown God, whom no man has seen or can see, but has only been seen by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, through whom we have knowledge of you, our Father. We thank you, God. We thank you for your mercy and your love and your compassion towards us. We ask you, Almighty God, that you would speak to our hearts and guide us in Jesus' name. Help us to cry out to you through Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to call to you, God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, my.
great man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His name shall be the Counselor, the Mighty Prince of Peace, of all earth kingdoms conqueror. Rain shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
the wonder of wonder she looked in his face such a sweet a voice spoke the bird into place the stars and the moon shining brightly on them the earth and the sun were created by him the wonder of wonder oh how could it be that God became flesh and was given for me that I might be came down of the man the wonder of wonder he died for my sin the wonder of wonder she looked in his face that his little voice spoke the world into place the stars and the moon shining brightly to them the earth and the sun were created by him the wonder of wonder, oh how could it be that God became flesh and was given for me, that I might be came down, walked among men, the wonder of wonder, he died for my sin, the wonder It is now time, friends, for the sermon portion of our divine service. Following this, we will have our time of communion, the most uh, special time we can celebrate really as a people of God in, involving such ordinary things like food. It's a very special and a sacred time which God has blessed and made holy. So I hope you do participate in it with me as I do it, even though this is a recording. Don't don't do it later. Don't delay it. Do it when you're watching this video. Let the Lord speak to you through it. And thank you so much to our musicians for their great work, especially my wife. You're inspired. Beautiful singing. Ruth, you're fantastic singing. Great piano playing. And Herman, thank you for all that strumming and your vocals. It is magnificent. We are returning to the Gospel of Luke after a short hiatus, a one-sermon uh, disrupt when we forayed into the book of Psalms, but we are back in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 13, verses 22 to 30. The title of our sermon is, When Jesus Doesn't Say What We Want. When Jesus Doesn't Say What We Want. In Luke chapter 13, Jesus is talking about the nature of the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about what God's plans are for the world, for his people. And he lays down two parables about God's kingdom. It is small, small enough to fit into the human heart, but large enough such that people can come and rest in the shade that it produces like a big tree. God's kingdom provides refreshment to people on this earth through the change it does in our hearts as Christians. But then, additional to that, we learn that God's kingdom is invisible. Not invisible due to its smallness, but invisible due to its nature. It is a spiritual kingdom. It is also an unstoppable kingdom, like how yeast spreads through dough, just going through, bubbling out, making wonderful fresh bread. So the kingdom of God spreads through the earth unceasing. It's in its natural element. It cannot be delayed or prevented. The Bible tells us very clearly, Luke says in the book of Acts, that the times, the epochs, have been set by the Father's authority. He has determined the timings of everything on this earth. He is sovereign over it all. Now, in the midst of all this, Jesus is asked a question, 
a question I think that we all would like to ask Jesus, which is, how many people are going to make it? How many people are going to be saved? How many people, Lord, will we be there in heaven? Is there hope? Is it set? What can we do? What can we do to make it to heaven to be with you forever? So how about we read this passage, Luke chapter 13, verses 22 to 28, New Revised Standard Version. I won't prejudice you by explaining Jesus' answer before he says it. We'll just read this together. Jesus went through one town and village after another, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Some asked him, someone, sorry, asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. When once the owner of the house has got up and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then in reply, he will say to you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evil doers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrown out. Then people will come from east and west, from north and south, and will eat in the kingdom of God indeed. Some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come before you. We ask, Lord, that you would touch my heart, touch my soul, touch my mind, touch everything that I am, that I may communicate your gospel truth clearly. Touch my listeners, Lord. Open their hearts that we may receive the word of God like the seed that it is when planted in receiving soil such that it grows into a mighty tree. Lord God, I ask that we would experience some of the life, the sturdiness, the steadfastness, and the power of your word today. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, there is a sense that the verses following verse 24, when Jesus answers the question, are all an expansion on his answer. So that's how we're going to treat it. It goes very simply. Jesus is moving from one town and village to another. And along the way, someone asks him a question. Lord, will only a few be saved? The wording seems to imply that Jesus has at various times talked about the difficulty or the smallness in number of those who will make it into God's kingdom. Will only a few be saved? Is that really what you're teaching us, God? That only a few will be saved. And Jesus replies to him with a deceptively simple answer. He says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Why is this deceptively simple? Well, the question at face value seems straightforward. How many will make it in? Jesus, however, peers into the heart of the matter. And his response questions the salvation of the person asking the question to him. It is not that he doubts that this man is a good man or a bad man. Rather, Jesus is telling us when we think about who is going to make it to heaven, our first concern should be our own self-examination. His answer is strive as a command, meaning you strive. You who asked me, you strive. Though he's answering to the whole crowd, he's making it a command. You strive to enter into the narrow door. So let's be clear here. Salvation is a matter that requires examination. One is not in by accident. One does not have no knowledge that you will make it. It is something we can be certain of, something we know we are achieving, something we can have assurance about, 
We need not agonize over guilt and sin and shame and our future destination. We should have all those settled in our mind and in our hearts. Not that we just know we're going to make it, but that we have criteria given to us by Jesus that will teach us how we can measure our selves. Now, of course, we have that knowledge. The Bible, when it speaks of what it means to be a Christian, says that the Holy Spirit lives in our heart. And the Holy Spirit cries to God and says, Father, my Father. And so we as believers feel a connection between us and God. We know he's there. But more than that, we feel drawn to him as a child is to a parent. But these sorts of feelings, depending on the day, depending on how we, you know, feel, can be a little challenging to decipher. And the first thing Jesus says is of great significance to us. He's telling us that the knowledge of our salvation doesn't rest in our feelings in this testimony of the Holy Spirit alone. Indeed, the Holy Spirit will tell you you're a child of God. But also, Jesus says, strive. You want to make it to heaven? Strive. You must work. You must move forward. You must be advancing. This is not an accident. This is consistent from day one. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and its righteousness. Then all these things shall be added unto you. Seek. Mobilize yourself, hunt, search, pursue. The kingdom of heaven does not fall into your lap. Salvation doesn't just come from heaven and hit you on the face so that you're unaware that you're going to make it to heaven. It is something you know, something that is a goal, something that you move towards and mobilize yourself to. Here's a simple measure. Whether you want to know if you're going to make it to heaven or not, do you strive to enter? Do you think about going there? Do you think about being with God? And that's, that's a very significant thing. Because what is heaven? Surely everybody, when they die, wants to be in a good place. Surely we strive to be in a good place when we die to a certain degree. Every human being has these thoughts. And that's why Jesus is specific. It is a narrow door. We are striving not for something abstract, not for something that is difficult or hard to understand. We are striving to enter through a narrow door. Through the narrow door. What does this mean? You should see heaven through the door you are going through. How does Jesus describe heaven? Well, according to Jesus, heaven is a feast where all God's people gather together. The family of God separated for a long time, reunited in one house the Father's house. We're going home to mom and dad for Christmas. That's what heaven is like. Heaven is going to be together with those you love from whom you have been separated, specifically God the Father and our brother, Jesus Christ, and our friend, the Holy Spirit, through whom we have our connection with home. That is the goal of every Christian. That is what is through the door. It is a lifetime, an eternity, with God. It's life everlasting with Almighty God. That's the nature of salvation. And because that is what salvation is, because heaven is a house, a place, a home, with an owner, with occupants, with requirements to come in, so then the door is appropriately spoken of as being narrow. Narrow. Now when Jesus says the door is narrow, he is not saying that you may strive and not make it. He is not saying that you will work trying to find Christ and you will not find him because you just can't fit in. There's only so many people can make it, only a certain number, and I'm sorry, you just you weren't on the guest list, you're done. That's not what Jesus means when he says the door is narrow. He is speaking of the narrowness of the door in two ways. The first I have enumerated. The door is Jesus Christ. He is the way of salvation. You want to go to the Father's house? You want to have a place in heaven? You need to believe in Jesus. You need to trust in the cross. We need to build our house on the rock. We need to apply his teachings and his sayings to our life. And if we are applying his teachings and his sayings to our life, 
we are entering through the narrow door. And as we are wrestling with his teachings, seeking the kingdom of God, we are striving to enter through the narrow door. And once we enter the narrow door, that is speaking of timing. Timing. This is the second way in which the way of salvation is narrow. It is narrow in its requirement. Jesus is the only way, and it is narrow in its timing. The Bible says it is appointed to each man one time that he must live and die and then face judgment. You have a life, you have a death, and then there is an accounting. There is a time when mercy is at an end, when you cannot make amends, when it's too late to repent, when you cannot seek anymore, when it's over. It may be that we sleep in the grave. It may be that Jesus returns, and while he's returning and we see him, it is too late to repent because Christ has arrived. That is the door. It shuts, and that's what Jesus says in the following verse. But when once the owner of the house, well, heaven is God's house, so the owner of the house is the Father. When once the owner of the house, the Father, who by his authority shuts the door, And you begin to stand outside and knock, saying, Lord, open to us. The time of salvation has passed, and the door is closed. We then reach the second bit of Jesus' answer, which is the majority of this parable of the narrow door. For many, I tell you, that's what he says, will try to enter and will not be able. And so in the following verses, we have the door shut. The way of Jesus is closed. You have lived and died and faced judgment. The way is over. Yet there will be people trying to enter into God's house. Who are these people? Well, they are people who call Jesus Lord. Lord, open to us. That's what they say. They know who Jesus is. They are acquainted with him. And they are, in fact, on their way to heaven. That is the most significant thing. See, they were working towards the door. They were going to the narrow door. They just missed the timing. They knew who Jesus was. They were going to church. They were doing their thing. But, well, it's it's too, I I don't want to change my life. I don't want to strive to enter the kingdom of heaven. They knew who God was. They believed there was a heaven, and they believed in the teachings of Jesus. But they did not strive, and so they missed the timing. They were weighed down with sin, and they did not repent, and they were too late. That is what Jesus is saying. Many will try. They will try, but it will be too late. The door will be shut. Many will try, but only a few will be saved. Not because God doesn't want them. Not because that Jesus isn't for everyone. But because not everyone is for Jesus. But because not everybody wants an eternity with God. Some people want a happy hunting ground. They want a time to relax. And they think heaven is a place that they are owed. There is nothing more ridiculous than thinking you have a right to be in someone else's house forever. And that they don't have the power to kick you out. If heaven is God the Father's house, it is his home. It is nonsense to think everyone will make it, especially if you were not invited, especially if you ignored the invitation, especially if the door is closed and you can no longer go in. Now, we know that Jesus says the invitation goes into all the world. Everyone is invited. He even says this in this passage. They will come from east and west and north and south. All over the world, people will hear God's cry. But the Bible, friends, is being delivered to whoever is hearing it. And so you who are listening, this parable is asking you, have you responded to the gospel call? Are you striving to enter the kingdom of God? This is what Jesus is saying. Do you have the door? Do you have an eternity with Jesus in front of you as your goal? Are you working towards that location? For many will try and they will not be able. And it's, they come to the door. It's not an easy thing. They come to the door, friends. It's a hard thing to hear. They come to the door and they say, Lord, open to us. 
And Jesus says, I do not know where you come from. Now, what does he mean, I do not know where you come from? This is very significant. It's one thing to say, I don't know you, right? It's one thing to say, oh, I'm not familiar with you. I'm not acquainted with you. I don't know your name. When Jesus is saying, I don't know where you come from, he's saying, I've never seen you in my life. You and I have never been friends. We are not acquainted. And I have not seen you once. And therefore, they reply to Jesus, we ate and drank with you. And you taught in our streets. Jesus, we, we saw you. You were even eating and drinking with us. You were among us. We are your church. You were among us. But Jesus says, I do not know where you come from. Go away from me, all you evil doers. What is their evil? Well, their evil is that they did not strive. That is a command Jesus has given to everyone. Seek the kingdom of God. Strive for the kingdom of God. And should we not, friends, indeed, we will not make it. Jesus doesn't say what we want to hear. He doesn't say that everybody's going to make it. It's all going to be great. He says, no. It is a time of weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what judgment day is that Jesus is bringing to the earth. What does it mean, weeping and gnashing of teeth? This seems kind of an archaic expression to us. But I don't know if you've ever had an intense time of grief such that your jaw clenched involuntarily and your teeth ground together. This is weeping and gnashing of teeth. I've experienced this a few times in my life. Not many, thank God. And hopefully we don't have to all experience this. But what Jesus is saying when he says weeping and gnashing of teeth, he means a grief that cannot be consoled, pain so great that it leads to an involuntary reaction in our body of grinding of the teeth. It is a sad day. People will weep and they will gnash their teeth when they see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the prophets in the kingdom of God and what you yourselves thrown out. It is not that they were never invited. It was not that they never had a place. It was that they were even on their way. They made it to the door, but they were thrown out. Do not sit on your laurels just because you go to church, just because you believe in God, just because you read the Bible. The Lord looks to the heart. He looks to those who want to be with him. And those are the ones who will be with him. Heaven is a house, according to Jesus, the Father's house. And heaven is a feast for the Son, Jesus Christ. A wedding feast between him and those he will spend forever after with. And that is an exclusive relationship. To invite a third party in is adultery. Heaven is only for the bride of Christ. And friend, we can be among them. The invitation has come out. Jesus is saying right now to you who are listening, strive. It's not too late. The door is narrow, not because you can't fit in, not because you're too bad of a person, not because you've made mistakes, not because you're too old, not because you're too young, not because you weren't raised in a Christian home, not because you weren't perfect. Jesus says, so long as you try, so long as you try, so long as you want to be with him, you will be with him. That's what he says. And that's how he ends it. He ends it on this note of hope. He says that there are many who are first, who will be last. And some, sorry, he says there are some who are first, who will be last, and some who are last, who will be first. What does he mean? We look out into the world, friends, and some people look incredibly Christian, incredibly righteous, incredibly holy, first into the kingdom of heaven. They look like they've got it made for lack of a better word. And then we see some who struggled, who strived, who barely managed to hang on, it seemed. They had their battles, they had their good days and their bad days. And they were a Christian, but it was, it was a hard fight. It wasn't easy for them. That is what Jesus is speaking of. There are some who seem to be last. They didn't really figure it out till the end. They struggled against all these sins and these trials and temptations and they just didn't seem like they were going to make it. But they did somehow. Jesus says from that group, 
some of them will be first. Why? Because Jesus sees our hearts. There are some friends who are righteous people who have done well, who have not faced trial, who have not had their love for Christ tested, who have been blessed by convenient circumstance, and God knows and God sees. Every thought, every intention, our full identity is open and bare before Almighty God. He knows the regrets. When we didn't really want to do this thing, but we felt pressured to do it, He knows when we made a mistake, we didn't obey the teaching of the Bible, but life was so hard, we didn't know what else to do. He knows when we're tired and we just forget. He knows when we're stressed. He knows when we're lazy. And he knows when we don't care. And he knows when we blaspheme. He knows when we feel bad. He knows all of it. And he is watching. And he sees you, friend, for who you are. And that can be a very comforting thing. If you are someone who's trying, who your heart, you want God, but it's a struggle. You have issues. Who doesn't? This person standing in front of you, I guess sitting now, I definitely have had issues that I've worked through to become a Christian and to follow God. There's no perfect man standing in front of you. And I'm sure we ourselves are not all that perfect. But God sees our hearts. He sees that we want to be with him, that we strive. And because we strive, we will make it. That is why you can have people who are in sin, not doing well, but the mercy of Christ is sufficient such that they have an honorable place in God's kingdom. And then we can indeed have the absolute opposite, where those who seem to have made no outward mistakes, yet they are not first in God's kingdom because God knows their heart, that they didn't really love him, with all that they had. Friend, Jesus cannot be fooled. And friend, Jesus is full of mercy for all our situations. In this teaching, when Jesus says, essentially, only a few make it, he's not saying that you can't make it. He's saying that many will not want to. They won't strive. They won't seek. They don't really want God. And so they won't make it. Let us not be among that number. (coughs) Do you want me to wait for you for communion, Mom? You can hold him, Mom. It's fine. But if he whines and makes noises. It's okay if he makes noise and you're taking communion. He just can't make too much noise. All right, if he's okay. Yeah, just hold him, Mom. It's okay. He's a funny kid. You look like you cried a lot upstairs, huh? Those are some big crocodile tears, little crocodile. Little crocodile. Little crocodile. It is now time, friends, for communion. We, were, we will be joined by a little guest, little Hugo Luke. So if you hear him make noise, just don't mind him. I myself will ignore him. As we go through this, I would just like to say that communion is a time of self-examination. This passage we were looking at in Luke 13 called us to examine ourselves. 
In the same way, communion asks us to examine ourselves, not for the purpose of condemnation, but for exhortation. Communion is to give you the strength to continue. And as Jesus says, if you are trying, if you are striving, if you want to enter, and you're alive, you know, you're, 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 you're here, you're kicking, you're, you're wanting to enter the kingdom of God. Communion is for you. It will give you strength for the fight. It will encourage you. It will help you and touch you and it will mobilize you forward. It is an opportunity to look and say, God, I have sinned. To think of our sins, to bring them to mind, to ask him to forgive us and to take anew that body and blood of the Lord so we can once more have at it. Once more, do our best. That's why it's so good to take communion frequently. Because Lord knows we need frequent restarts in life. Now, our passage of reflection for communion comes from the book of Acts. uh, Chapter 2, the 46th verse to the 47th verse. Allow me to read it for you. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. When it says they broke bread at home, we understand that to mean they took communion and they were rejoicing. They were joyful. People were joining. They were just having a good time. What's the significance of this? As a Christian, as someone who has God, you are sufficient. We should be, as people of God, sufficient. Nothing should keep us down. No COVID should discourage God's people. Nothing we go through in our week should make a permanent dent on our joy. Because we have God, because we have communion, we have a sufficiency in our life, a happiness, a reason to praise. It is good enough to just have a normal life. It's good enough to be content with waking up, working, having a family, eating, sleeping, visiting friends. We don't need drugs. We don't need drink. We don't need anything for our joy. We have Christ, the new wine and the new bread. All we need to survive and to make it through life is given to us in Jesus. A lot of Christians are looking to the world to supplement their joy. But I tell you, God has put eternity in the heart of man. Nothing on this earth will give you sufficiency and true security. Because nothing in this world lasts forever. Except your own soul and God. And the Lord has so made it that apart from him, you will not find completeness. Now you will find temporal happiness in life. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? But that is not what I'm speaking of. I'm speaking of sufficiency. So I hope in this communion time, we ask God to put in us that wellspring, those rivers of living water that we may be continually refreshed and a refreshing to others. I will give us a moment of silence as we reflect on our sins, asking God to help us and strengthen us, and then I will read our communion passage. Prior to that, I will, of course, pray over our communion uh, sacrament. Lord, there is no one who does not sin, and we have an advocate for our sin in Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is the propitiation, the sacrifice, the price paid for not only our sins, but the sins of the whole world. There is blood sufficient for the worst of men. There is blood sufficient for the best, but we all have equal need of it. God, I ask that you bless this time of communion, These emblems, you bless them as we partake of them. That you sanctify us through your Holy Spirit, making us holy. We thank you, God. Forgive us our sins by the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. 
For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, when he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread, and then he broke it. And when he had given thanks, thank you, Lord, for this bread, he said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you partake of this bread? In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you partake of the shed blood of Jesus Christ? For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Friends, would you receive the benediction blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be satisfied blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god and blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of god and blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And you, you blessed of the Lord, be blessed in your going out, be blessed in your coming in from now till forevermore, world without end. Amen. In our sermon today in Luke uh, chapter 13, verses 22 to 30, Jesus answered the question, how many will be saved? Will only a few be saved? Jesus gave a somewhat indirect answer, yes, only a few will be saved, but not for lack of effort on God's part. Not because God didn't want them. Not because God didn't give them a chance. Jesus said, strive, desire, work, try to enter through the narrow door, the blood of Jesus Christ that covers our sins into heaven. For many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able. Not for lack of ability of the blood to cover sin. Not because Jesus isn't for everyone. And not because there's another way. Because there is no other way. But because they did not strive when the time of striving was given. There is a time to live. Then there is a time to die. And then there is a time to face judgment. There comes a day when once the owner of the house has got up and shut the door and there will be no more mercy left. Friend, let us not delay. Let us not let heaven move on without us. Let us not be excluded from God's kingdom. Let us not be outside of the bridal party. Let us be there with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us desire to be with him and know that God will give you all you need to get there. And you don't know. You don't know how much God loves you. You don't know how much he wants to bless you. And give you good things. Do not be afraid little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure. To give you the kingdom. How about I just say a closing prayer. And then I will dismiss you. Father, we thank you and we come before you. We ask that you bless this week. You bless us. Holy Spirit, you be on us. Give us strength, comfort, and encouragement. Forgive us our sins. Jesus, I am a sinner. Would you pray with me? I am a sinner. I need your help to make it. I want to make it. I want to be there with you, God. Holy Spirit, come. Cleanse my heart and give me strength to live for you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Pray daily. Go in the peace and the forgiveness of God. Lord knows we need it. And have a great week. Take care and God bless.